Okay, welcome back to Contract Revolution, everybody. This is your host, Benji. I hope you're having a great day. Misaligned expectations between contractor and client are the root of all evil when it comes to hitting or missing budget, finishing the project on time or way behind schedule, and creating a happy customer who will refer you for years or not. One of the most critical links in the overall chain that is your business's workflow is the sales to production handoff. You get this right and producing the job you sold can, believe it or not, go off relatively without a hitch. Get it wrong though and your production team can be stuck in a hellish nightmare for way longer than planned, hurting your project's profitability, your your overall team unity, and a whole host of other things too. It is for this reason that mastering your sales to production handoff is so important. It seems more straightforward than it actually is though, which is why we've got one of our favorite guests back in studio. He's a friend of the show, Paul Atherton, uh, Breakthrough Academy's most senior construction coach. And he's here to explain how to perfect this all important intersection between sales and production. Highlights for me, uh, he goes through the six crucial points that you need clarity on with your customer and how most estimators and salespeople just barely understand one of them. And then he shares two easy to use systems that help you or your team extract the right information from the customer, set the correct expectations with them, and then communicate all of this effectively to the production team so that they can fulfill on all of that. And just because we're nice, we're providing these two systems for free. You can download and implement both the project charter and the DECA analysis right away by clicking on the link in the description. If you like this episode and it resonates with you, I highly recommend recommend you go check those systems out. It's our way of saying thanks for listening. Okay, let's dive into how to master your sales to production handoff with Paul. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Um, I am joined by a friend of Contractor Evolution, the great and powerful Paul Atherton, one of our most experienced and wise construction coaches with Breakthrough Academy. We've had him on other episodes. If you've not listened to those, go check them out. Um, he is one of our best and brightest, and we're really excited to have him. He brought me a coffee. He came all the way over from the island. He's taken some time out of his busy schedule to shed some light on what we call the sales to production handoff. This is the link in the chain where the sales team, the estimation team, the people that have basically uh, quoted the job, estimated it, made made promises to the customer, sold this uh, to the customer, is now passing this off to the production team so that they can go build it. And um, this is often a part of the process, part of the workflow that's fraught with communication breakdowns, missed expectations, it's a very, very, very critical handoff, as you can probably imagine. Paul, let's start with an easy one. Why is this link in the chain so important? Um, this, this link is extremely important because if it's weak or broken, you really increase the likelihood of core issues coming up, okay? Because uh, typically what you see in any transaction in life between like customers and vendors, um, both parties will have movies in their mind that they've made up based on past experiences right. on how like wh how that transaction is going to play out. Um, so if, if, if you don't have a strong link in this chain, what happens is there's misalignment with both those movies. And what you see is like friction and communication, um, uh, like trust issues can develop between both parties. You'll see um, interdivisional uh, like yeah. strife happening amongst like the company. Like the production team's like, oh, totally. these sales guys yeah. just screwed yeah. us yeah. again. The sales guys are going, man, the crew is complaining again. Like this huge interdivisional kind of people are can get at each other's throats when this is not done well. Yeah, totally. You start they start getting political with each other, right? Right, and then and then what that leads to is is uh, it, like you'll you'll probably find an increased likelihood of there being quality issues. Mm. And then that'll affect your referral count. And then obviously the company's net profit at the end of the year. Um, so those are some not so good things. Uh, obviously very, very important to clean this up. How, like from your experience, you've worked with a lot, a lot, a lot of different companies. 
How big of an issue is this for construction and trades, uh, broadly speaking? Do you see this a lot? Yeah, this is one of those... Um, this, this is one of those areas of a company's operation that tends to get missed where most people think um, they're just good enough. They're, and when you ask them, hey, what does this like handoff look like? They go, well, you know, it, it basically breaks down to like, we have good memories, we have good conversations, we communicate. And then... Um, they're doing uh, it from build, the head? Well, and then they say, and then we'll build like a, a list of like what what we're doing on the job and then we pass that list off to production and then what like what more do you need and I'm like well that's like very valid by mm. the way like they made a list but there's what we found is that in order to be like really really good in this area there's like a few other things that uh, should be taken into account what what kinds of details often get missed do you find well there's there's like six categories so um the the first one like I mentioned is is deliverables and that's where a lot of companies stop so they'll build a list of like really simple deliverables and they'll say like Okay, cu- customer is going to pay us like sixty five thousand, and we're going to go do X. And here's a list of all the things that we're doing. Okay, production, go do those things. It's good enough, right? Right. But there's other things too. Um, like another, like there's basically five more things. There's like core needs of the, of customer. Of the customer. There's um, project exclusions, project constraints, project assumptions, and then there has to be an assessment of the company's capabilities to actually follow through with any promises that were made. So most most business owners are operating on one out of six of those things, which is essentially uh, the client has asked us to paint the house with two coats of blue paint. We're going to do the windows in black and the doors we're not going to touch. Go do this. Or, you know, the customer has paid us to build this retaining wall, add some trees to the front yard, uh, you know, d- d- build a patio with some pavers in the back, whatever. But it's you're saying like the deliverables part is a fairly rudimentary checklist that misses a whole bunch of like nuance and detail and, and emotion, opinion that like the customer may have that hasn't been extracted from them or communicated to the production team in any effective way. And that's where a lot of these, uh, you say it like they have movies in their mind. The production team is like, well, this is just the way we always do these jobs. And the customer has another movie which is like, well, this is the way I always like to have these jobs done. And they're like, they're playing completely different reels. They don't, they don't look the same. They don't sound the same. And that's where this stuff kind of crops up downstream. Yeah. Like, like the, the company has been like performing like a lot of these jobs over and over and over again. So they may have their own movie reel and the customer might've done this, a similar type of job with a contractor once or twice in their life. And they've watched maybe some programs on TV and got some advice from their neighbors. And then <laughs> they have their own movie reel and there needs to be um, some sort of a system in place to try to, um, bring those uh, as bring, close together exactly, as possible. Yeah. yeah. Is this in your experience? And I'm not trying to point fingers here. I'm a sales guy. Uh, is this more the fault of sales production? A little bit of both. Like, do, is there? I'm not trying to shed blame, but I am wondering like where the responsibility of this lies. Who whose shoulders this responsibility lies on more squarely? Um, well, that's that's the that's. The problem is people ask this question a lot in, in their companies. They're like, they're like, oh, whose fault this is this? This is the sales fault. Or this right. is the production guys. I sold this job and they're not producing and making the customer happy. You know, the, and so it's actually no one's fault. Okay. Let's just state it's not anybody's fault. It's, it's um, the reason why these issues come up is because there's just usually a process, a breakdown in processes or there's an, a, a significant improvement that we can make in the processes in that handoff. Can we talk about some of those improvements? Yeah, for sure. What, yeah. what, so when you're working with a business who is like really clearly struggling with this by your assessment, you're getting to know the entrepreneur, you're getting to know the inner workings of the business and you're like, okay, this is cl- like your sales to handoff, or your sales to production handoff is, is broken or weak. What types of systems do you begin to implement uh, that start to move the needle and, and, and improve this? Well, um, I think it goes back to those kind of six categories that I mentioned. So just to kind of uh, shed some light on, on those six things and to list them out again, it was customer, so it was deliverables, it was customer core needs, um, job exclusions, job constraints, job assumptions, and then an assessment of whether or not the company has the capability to follow through on any promises that were made. I'm just writing this down. So it's oh, okay. core needs, exclusions? Yeah. Well, core needs, yeah, exclusions, uh, the list of deliverables, which is what most mm-hmm. people do. Um, uh project constraints, like job constraints, Mm -hmm. um, any assumptions that are made, Mm -hmm. and then uh, an assessment of whether or not the company can follow through with um, any promises that were made. 
Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Carry on. So, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, like I said, like a lot of companies, they'll make a list of the deliverables. They'll pass that off to production and be like, if you do this, the customer is going to give us $65,000 or just, you know, something. And um, uh, an another thing that needs to be discussed, though, is what is the customer's core needs? Because, you know, I like, uh, I'll, I'll, ref I'll reference the Sandler sales program because mm. one of the things that they talk about is um, customers make buying decisions based on pain. So um, the sale, a good salesperson is always asking what uh, pain points will the outcome of this job solve for the customer hundred percent in order for them to make a buying decision and they make that clear to the customer and anyways whatever those needs are with respect to like style quality um, budget anything like that that information needs to be passed on to production and, mm -hmm. and made like really clear and there needs to go ahead it's not enough to extract it and use it for the sake of the sale which is sort of like where I think a lot of sales people's universe ends they're like the deal's done. Like yeah. I, I got oh. to their core needs. I understand what this job is really about for them. And I whipped up a script. I pulled together some talking points. I showed them a few p brochures and some collateral to make them feel confident that we were going to resolve that pain for them. And I got the deal done. Great. Pat on the back. Move on to the next estimate. The important like part that needs to happen is that really clearly needs to be communicated to the production team that probably to you listeners it sounds like super obvious you're like duh but i think our experience is like that often does not happen it's it's left at it's left at the estimate it's not it doesn't make its way onto the clipboard of like the project manager the crew lead to deliver on later yeah 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 exactly that's, okay. a, that's a that's a really good point yeah it's it's e if if it's easy for uh somebody who's selling the job to then to just sell the job and then move their focus onto another sales prospect prospect and not pass those critical core needs on down the line. So um, that's, that's the one thing. Um, the other thing we talked about the deliverables, like everyone's usually pretty good at making a list of um, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever uh, line items are, there should be a um, executed in the work scope. But um, another question that needs to get asked in the sales uh, in the actual like sales process is what what are we not doing on this project? Like what are the exclusions? Right, that's what you mean by exclusions. Yeah, like, this is the stuff we're definitely explicitly saying we are not doing this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Why is that so important? Well, I, I think any, anybody uh, listening to this who 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 produced jobs for a customer will have multiple examples of one of their that they can reference in their past where the customer went, "Hey, I thought I was also paying for this." Too. Like, I thought that you guys, uh, you know, in construction, let's just say, I thought that, you know, all this money I'm paying for, you know, office management and project management on my job meant that somebody would be available for me to talk to 24-7, right? right? Like, you right. got, like, I want this boutique experience. It's like, well, that's not really what's, what's happening here. Or, you know, you, you can come up with lots of examples. But the point is, it's, it's really important to ask, okay, this is what we're doing on the job. Now, what are we not doing? Mm. Like, we are not doing landscaping. Mm -hmm. We're just going to build the house. Mm -hmm. We're not doing landscaping. That's a separate separate thing. Is that the... So, um, in your experience, do these exclusions need to be... Like, that That must be the job of the estimator or salesperson. You would want to be setting these exclusions up front and early and then reinforced again down the chain by your production team. Yeah. 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 Well, you're just telling the production team, this is what we're not doing. The customer has been made aware of that. So anyway, that, that's our bumper as far as that's where the, the work scope stops, essentially. Are so there some that, that helps the project, um, that helps eliminate scope creep from happening, unless the customer is actually paying for it through change orders. Are there common, like, uh, exclusion things that customers, like, are, have you seen some patterns around this where customers are like, well, I thought, like, I was going to get, you just, like, fix the closets, too. Or, like, are there, like, are there, are there examples of, certain exclusions that customers very often assume is included that isn't yeah it's it's, it's, it's the it's the whole um like uh, like have you ever heard the phrase death by a thousand paper cuts yeah. yeah yeah so customers can oh i got all these people working on my job i'll just ask them to do this <laughs> take the all person, the garbage yeah, yeah yeah you know just little like tiny yeah. little things but if it, it adds up eventually you start to see the profitability of the job will start to go off course and the schedule will go off course because um, you're just starting to do like a lot of these kind of like little things. Like, oh, I, you know, we, we put a shelf in the, you know, the washer and dryer room and then the customer walked up to it and went, oh, wait a sec. No, I need this, you know, lowered by eight inches. Oh, mm -hmm. well, that's not what the design drawing says. And you signed off on it and you need to like, 
there needs to be a line there. Anyways, that's what, and so that's like a small thing, but another, like you see bigger things happening where the customer like, we're painting or something. It's, well, I thought you guys would paint the shed. Oh, we didn't quote on that. Right. right. So I've done a lot. Of, I've done a lot of sheds in okay. my day. Yeah. yeah I've so painted a lot of sheds for free. <laughs> okay. A lot there, of sheds for free. That's a perfect example. Yeah. 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 Fences. Like in the paint, <laughs> the painting world, it's easy. Like you, there's just so many things like, well, I just like, how you're going to do this. And it's like, no man, like this is, but because it wasn't, very explicitly said verbally reinforced in the contract communicated again at the production mm. team by the production team when you get to that part of the, the job process it's usually you the owner is not there and it's some crew lead or some job site manager goes what the hell okay well let's, let's just try and get this done quickly yep. and that's that's where that scope creep can can really sit in so yep. exclusions are essentially the things that you're not doing yep um, do you want to talk a little bit about constraints, assumptions, and then I think the last thing you said was like the ability to deliver the job? Yeah, so um, constraints are really important. Those are the bumpers that you put up in the project in order to just help ensure that the project, the, the, like when the job or the project is complete, it's going to um, uh, end with the desired result mm -hmm. for the customer and, the, and, the, and your organization. Mm -hmm. So simple example of constraints would be like, this is how much money we're going to spend. This is how much money the customer is going to spend. This is when the customer ne needs us to be like complete. And this is, um, and we've agreed to be done by that date. Like those are really simple project constraints. Uh, completion dates. Good yeah. example of a simple constraint. What would yeah. be another one? Um, a lot of like scheduling activities that um, need to happen like during the life cycle of the job, if it's a three week job or like a two year job, there's a lot of little constraints in there. Like, um, Oh, the window package has to be ordered because you can't get windows anymore in right. two months. It takes, you know, four to six months. So we need to order that window package right now. Like that's considered a project constraint, like that anything on the critical path. Got it. And okay. then sometimes customers sense. will come up with little one-off things that, Hey, this is a project constraint. We can't park here. Because like it's just we would call that a like a minor constraint, but the customer has said like one of my core needs is you know that put your vehicles over there. I need yeah. access to the driveway. Or you know we're going to be using the property. Even we can't have you guys. We're going to be using the backyard. You know for you know my wife's birthday or something all day Thursday. So in two weeks, so you guys can't be there. Like that's another kind of a small example. It's not one of the like. Like big project constraints that we want to think about are like budget, schedule, what are we doing? But then there's like lots of little nuances there that can also be considered constraints. But, but those little nuances are really important. Those yeah. are like those are like the uh, the special considerations that take it, you know, a customer's experience from like average, they did the work, they got it done, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with it. It's like, man, these people really got me. They really looked after the stuff that mattered to me and I'm super happy. I'm going to refer them to my friend, like th these special considerations, these minor constraints yep. are the difference maker. Yep. Um, what, what, what about assumptions? I think that was number five on the list. So this is, this is my favorite one. Um, anytime, anytime there's an issue on a job, I think at least, anytime there's an issue on a job, you can trace it back to a false assumption that was made. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. somewhere back in the life cycle of the job, like I said, whether it's a one week job or a two year job, if the, when an issue arises, you can trace it back to some sort of a faulty assumption that, that was made. On, uh, by either party, by the by customer I, or by the yeah, estimator, or by yeah. the contractor? Where like, it, 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 it can be like literally anything. So anybody who plans these jobs will be able to come up with examples. Like, like one assumption that, um, uh, like like a contractor might make in like working on like somebody's apartment in the city is that they assume because of past jobs they had access to like the freight elevator. Right. Just as an example, they're like, yeah, we always will use the, be able to use the freight elevator, but maybe in this one particular building they only get access between like ten and two on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Well, now that really affects the planning of the job and, Hugely. and yeah, and it's, so that's just like one small assumption that you really if you if you can think through these things you can really highlight it at the beginning and be like, okay, um, like for this particular example. Um, okay, uh, we're assuming that we have access to the freight elevator basically during working hours. And the customer goes, oh, I don't know. Let me talk to the strata. Oh, no, that's actually not, not, the, not case. the case. And you guys need to plan for that. So anyways, the, the point is if an assumption, um, uh, if the accuracy of an assumption um, has an impact on the success of the job, it's, it's important to highlight those things as much as possible. You're never going to get all of them, but if you think, if you start asking that question, those things will start to come, those assumptions will start coming to the surface. You really got to watch 
your your assumptions is what you're saying. If you're if you're kind of filling in the blanks, going, yeah, I I think this is how it's going to be. It's like red flag. Hold on, double check that because there could be a whole a whole list of things downstream from that assumption that become way harder, way longer to fulfill because you just haven't haven't checked in on that. Yeah, like one of the, one of the things that we've seen here in Vancouver is is permitting has just been extended way out or like getting an environmental assessment done. It just takes way longer. And, and like two years ago, guys were assuming that we were in the same world as we, that we were back in 2018. But the accuracy that those assumptions was was wrong. And what it did is it extended out um, the life, the start dates of a lot of jobs. Mm. And yeah, it would have just been uh, any, any companies that were like, wait a sec, are this job is supposed to start, we're assuming that this job is going to start in June because we're going to get permits and environmental assessments done. Maybe we should check with the city and right. make sure that this assumption is accurate. Right. That's yeah. a great example. Yeah. Um, what was the last one? What was the last of the six? So, um, wh- like, one thing that causes um, uh, strife to, to happen, like I said, some of these political little issues to happen between, like, uh, sales and production is when um, the sales team makes some sort of a promise and then the production team goes we can't actually fulfill that promise what were you guys thinking and there right. yeah and so you always want to you always want to give production the opportunity to just ensure that the company has the capability to fulfill those promises mm-hmm. yeah. i've had a lot of conversations with um like i've had a lot of co- conversations with fulfillment teams production teams mm-hmm. who are frustrated with me about things that I've said we could do. And it's and it's tough because those these are people like you're on the same team. It's like and they're coming to you being like, man, like you <laughs> you really screwed me here. Cause this customer has this this long list of things that they expect me to do. And I don't have the capacity for that. We're not set up to do that. What were you thinking? And you're just like it, you feel you feel really bad because you kind of you kind of screwed over your buddy in those instances. Yeah, yeah. So would you call that? Um, you use the word promises. You might call it expectation setting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So um, do we have like do we have some practical systems? Some thing like these are the things that need to be considered. I get that. Like how do we sort of implement a process to ensure all these boxes get checked? Well, um, there, I think there's two systems that um, we're going to include with with this episode, and mm-hmm. one of them is is that we call a project charter. And what that does is that just has a, a, it just asks the right questions a, a, ahead of time that sales can fill in and then pass those answers off to production. So those would be things like, who are the main decision makers on the job? What are the customers' constraints with respect to budget, schedule, quality? You know, things like that. Um, and then if if that information is like at least identified and passed on to production then now production uh, now production uh, has will have a really high understanding of um, what good will look like uh, once the project is complete so that's that's like one thing that, that helps pr- go ahead. that project charter helps you ask the right questions to yeah. the client yeah it just systemizes what information do we need to get during the sales process it's an extraction process. Yeah, that's a good way. I need, it, like, yeah. I need to get this customer is not necessarily going to volunteer this to me because they're busy and preoccupied and this isn't their job. Like, it's your responsibility as an estimator, as a salesperson to execute this extraction process well, get all the information complete, get it written down. And this project charter you're saying is like a pretty well built system to just help someone do that very, very consistently, uh, v- very uniformly from estimate to estimate, from bid to bid, from project to project. Yeah, and then what's what's really important is when you have those answers, then um, you have the ability to uh, recognize whether or not the company has the capability to actually fulfill those expectations. And if they don't, you say that. You can bring it to light and then there's no issues, but and that'll then that and if you if you can do that early on in, in the sales process or just right around the time when the job is about to be handed off to production mm-hmm. you really decrease um, the uh, amount of friction that will happen later on okay if that's not highlighted and then another thing that we're going to uh, another system that we're going to include is a document that we call just a deca analysis and what that does is that just asks the right questions uh, helps the um uh, user asks the right questions around what deliverables are involved with the job, what exclusions 
um, that need to be taken into account when planning the job, what constraints are on the job, and then what assumptions you're making. And then we have really good examples in that document just to help people get creative and, and um, uh, help them uh, like it, take those processes, those systems, and inject them into the, their, own, uh, their own organizations. That's what DECA stands for, deliverables. Exclusions, constraints, and assumptions. Yep. Okay. Cool. So these two, would you say these two systems are pretty intuitive? If a contractor downloaded these and read through, they're like, "Oh, okay, I, I see how this fits into my business." Yep. Okay. Cool. Yep. So, guys, everyone listening, like this will be available. There'll be a link in the description. You go click that link. You can download both of these things for free. Um, as with a lot of our episodes, we love to give stuff away. We want to make implementation easy. So go check those out. Um. Sort of final big questions here for you, Paul, is like, what will a business owner notice if these two things are implemented and this link in the chain gets solidified, gets closed? Well, it it goes back to what I was saying about that that phrase, death by a thousand paper cuts. Yeah. Like you get one paper cut, you're like, oh, that's kind that's of fine. annoying. Yeah. You get five, you're like, wow, this is turning into kinda a bad hurts. day. You get a thousand, like, no, no, it's, you get like more than that. It's turning into a really bad day. And, um, uh, if, if you can figure out this handoff really well, um, all those little paper cuts that are annoying during production, like there's, there's friction and communication between you and the customer, you and any um, trade partners that you're working with, um, uh, interdivisional communication, all that friction will tend to smoothen out. Okay, and that'll, that'll um, uh, move your jobs down the path of them just being run smoother, um, they're going to be done on time. You're going to have more continuity across your company, mm-hmm. more profitability, happier customers, yeah. more referrals, um, lower, go, like fewer go backs, not as many quality control issues. But the thing you said that I think is maybe lost on people is this team unity thing. Like mm-hmm. your sales team is no longer blaming your production team. Your production team is no longer frustrated with your sales team. There's alignment with the group and everyone is on the exact same page about what you guys do, how you do it, who you do it for. Um, and I, I really would encourage business owners to reflect on this. It's like if there's any amount of animosity between those two divisions in your business is very, very likely that this sales to production handoff is not being done well. Here's two really simple systems that you can inject into your business to start to clean that up. Yeah. Um, awesome. Thanks for being here, Paul. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.